My name is Michael. I'm a PhD fellow at Copenhagen Business School and part of Renew. At the moment, I'm on parental leave, and so my days are not about books, papers, seminars, and interviews, but about spending some time with my daughter. And when she has fallen asleep, I will tell you a bit about my research. So my PhD, it's about attitudes towards migrants among caseworkers that work in the Swedish Unemployment Agency. For my postdoc, um, it basically allowed me to take what I learned in my PhD and then just broaden my view, just take all these exciting research ideas and questions that were still left open and now start to explore different directions. And we look at how European Union directives actually influence social rights at the national level. And one of it is looking at work-life balance. So when we know that most of the time men don't take enough leave and that leaves certain sort of labor market inequalities for that are entrenched between men and women. So the sort of the, 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 the links between what happens at home mm. and what happens uh, on the on the labor market. We are looking into so-called hiring discrimination in Sweden, which means that if in a company people are hired, but there is um, maybe a di difference between who gets hired and who does not get hired because of the way they look. We are exploring that with a new um, method called eye tracking. So we are looking into how people that make these hiring decisions actually scan the CV and potentially focus a lot on how you look with a technique where you can measure how your eyes look at the CV, that's called eye tracking. So you can track literally the eye movement and so we are hoping that we can get a bit closer to the mechanisms of why this discrimination occurs in Sweden for now. I'm still working a little bit on what I've been doing in my PhD. Uh, which is a fair bit about status decline. It's into despite the fact that you still have a job and you cling on a job, but why is it that you feel left behind? You're not accorded the same status and recognition vis-a-vis -vis the past. How that influences sort of political behavior, both in terms of voting, but also in terms of welfare preferences. Right? My PhD is an all history project about seafarer identity and containerization. The Nordic countries are old maritime countries with old maritime traditions and seafaring is to various degrees part of national identity. With containerization from the 1970s and onwards, global trade was transformed and international shipping as well was fundamentally transformed. What I'm interested in is the lived experience of this great historical transformation the structural, the technological, the organizational, the material changes of container shipping affected the identity of the seafarers. That the Nordics are definitively one of the leaders in terms of the green transition vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the EU member states. And can it be also a just transition, right? A socially just, socially fair, and inclusive because a green transition has given rise to such distinct winners and losers that we have no capacity by which to help shift the losers at least into some level that they could resemble winners. Can we do something to close the gap not just in the short run but also in the long run? My name is Frederick and I'm a PhD student at Center for Nordic Studies here at the University of Helsinki. I spend most of my time writing on my dissertation which is about an institution called the Nordic German Writers House uh, which was institutionalized in Nazi Germany in 1934 and ran its course until 1939. The idea was that the house was supposed to be a place where young Nordic writers could go and meet young German writers and here they could talk about art, literature, um, even to some extent about politics and ideology. And while the house certainly served propagandistic purposes, I argue that it did so while at the same time pursuing uh, cultural relations uh, in a quite sincere manner, um, but of course still in a way that fit with national socialist um, ideology. Uh, and so in my dissertation I ultimately tried to improve our understanding of the role culture and cultural relations played in Nazi Germany, especially in outreach efforts uh, directed at the Nordic countries.
My name is Martin Johansson, uh, and I'm a PhD student in history at Sudetan University. My name is Anna Bark Persson. I'm a PhD candidate within the Renew Research Hub. I'm doing my PhD at Sudetan University in Stockholm, and sort of my subject area is uh, gender studies. My aim is to engage with new perspectives on what Nordic identity and Norden as an imagined place has been like um, between 1936 and 1994. This is what sports pages in 1936 looked like uh, during the Olympic Winter Games, uh, which was hosted by Nazi Germany. When I started to look on like what the Olympic Games were like and how they were represented in the media, I very soon realized that most of the discourse occurred or was present and visible during Winter Games and really only in relation to Sweden, Norway and Finland who together cultivated a sort of almost North Nordic uh, or at least winter sporting Nordic identity uh, because in all these three countries some sports at the Olympics were perceived, perceived of as particularly Nordic. So the idea of a sort of far and mysterious North that is at once sort of barbaric and utopian is a sort of very long sort of cultural trope. I look at fantasy literature uh, with the successes of these sort of huge TV productions like Game of Thrones and The Witcher and Wheel of Time. Fantasy has become a very sort of central and, and popular part of, of sort of the media landscape. Uh, both sort of Vikings and, and sort of a cold, icy, wild north at the top of the world that sort of very, very obviously draws inspiration from uh, Nordic and Scandinavian history. I'm interested in, in sort of understanding what these sort of motifs are, how they look like, what sort of shapes they take, uh, but also what their sort of function is or what they sort of do in these stories. Uh, and likewise, the Viking is a character that sort of true history has sort of moved between the position of hero and villain, depending on sort of who is writing uh, these sort of depictions and, and, and what for. And here, of course, I'm sort of talking about the popular Viking and not sort of like his, the historical people that lived in sort of Viking Age Scandinavia. Uh, the popular Viking is, of course, a creature that has sort of taken uh, has a different life in sort of the popular imagination than it sort of than uh, than sort of the history sort of draws on. I just got back from Dar es Salaam, where I was at the, the Royal Norwegian uh, Embassy there, uh, working with uh, archival material in Tanzania. As a contemporary historian, I look at Nordic development assistance within the energy sector focusing specifically on East Africa, and in particular, on Tanzania. In fact, my doctoral research project, the Tanzanian-Norwegian Energy Relationship, 1989 to 2020, looks at this relationship through three specific energy projects with heavy uh, Norwegian and, in some cases, Nordic involvement. Yes, Finland and Sweden are in the picture here as well. You have the, the Nordic and Norwegian business communities involvement. You have engaged civil society actors. You know, how did Norway work as a sort of uh, middleman between um, the Swedes and the Finns or, you know, working with the World Bank as well? And then you have the whole thing with the pet petroleum industry in terms of oil for development. The oil for development program in Tanzania, which was uh, part of the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, NURADS, a uh, global initiative to help uh, countries like Tanzania better make use of their petroleum resources. Very interesting to see how the Nordics are perceived and how that perception has evolved from different historical roots. East Africa, uh, Asia, uh, South America, where there has been a significant uh, Norwegian and Nordic uh, development presence. My thesis uh, is about anti-fascism in the Nordic countries from 1945 to 1975. And specifically, we'll deal with how the dictatorships of Southern Europe were resisted amongst the, much of the left and the labor movement in these countries. It's a book written by a bunch of leftists in Sweden, and it's called Solidarity but it's also called uh, an anti-fascist yearbook of 1968 and 1969. We're trying to connect 
anti-fascism at this period of time with, for example, racist, uh, with anti-racism and other threats. They're also trying to make anti-fascism more relevant to the different movements on the left. Obviously, it's a very complex topic. Um, what they call fascism might not be objectively viewed by scholars of our time as fascism.